in a series called A Different World. A different world. I read that email because everything that she said in that email is why we need you to serve and invite for homecoming because somebody, some freedom freedom needs your invitation and they need you to serve. You heard what she said about the parking lot and the greeters and the worship and production and kids and all of that. All of that contributes to what it is that God is doing because when you've been church hurt, you showed up here looking for a reason not to come back. When someone's been church hurt, they showed up looking for a reason not to come back. And we need to provide them with excellence so that every excuse they have will be squashed so that when the word of God goes forth, all it does is prick their hearts. We're in a series called A Different World, and uh, we've been exploring this a different world that God has called us to, this spiritual world that we're called to live in. And Pastor Dan uh, did me a solid, and, and because of uh, an emergency that I had or uh, some rearranging of my schedule, uh, he allowed, God allowed him to give us an orientation and talk about the admission into this different world, that it is by grace alone that we are saved, and that because of that grace we receive the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God then connects us to the kingdom of God in ways that we were not connected before. Then last week, I tried to give you an understanding about the yard. This week, I want to talk to you from the title, The Prerequisites. Uh, the show, The Different World, is, is, is a great show. And if you ever, if, if because of this series you started watching it, you got hooked. You can't stop watching it. You might have watched the first couple episodes to remind yourself of how it got started. And once you start watching, you just hooked. You can't stop watching the show. A Different World is that good, right? And so there was one episode that I remember. Uh, actually, I was talking to Ralph, as we do often about messages and things. And I was telling him about what I wanted to preach. And he reminded me of this episode where Dwayne Wayne, who is a math major, Dwayne Wayne, who is a math major, is afraid to take a particular class. Dwayne Wayne is this math major, and he's also a math genius. As a matter of fact, Dwayne is such a math genius that he is a math tutor on campus. When he wants to get with Denise, he arranges the fact of him to become her math tutor, right? And, and, and so there is this, 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 uh, this, this understanding of the character of Dwayne Wayne from the beginning of the show that he is a math genius. He is smart at math. He knows it inside and out. He is really good at it. As goofy as he is, he's great at math. And so he shows up uh, on campus one day, and his boy Ron is trying to challenge him because he's afraid to take the class of Professor War. They call him Professor War because he's hardcore, and he's, he, he's one of those dudes who's really intimidating. He's that person that he really knows his stuff, but if you don't know your stuff, he, he can be intimidating. And Dwayne Wayne, even though he knows the trajectory of where he's supposed to be going, even though he knows the assignment and the destiny that he has, he knows that math is his major, and in order to graduate, he's got to do certain things. He's trying to avoid something hard. He's trying to avoid something that's going to get him to the next place, the next level, the next uh, 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 opportunity for him. And he says, I don't have to take Professor War. I can take somebody else. Now, regardless, he was going to have to take the class. But he was getting ready to take the prerequisite the easy way. But, but somebody convinced him and said, listen, man, you can take the easy way or you can get in line and take this class and prove that you've been called to this. Now, long story short, Dwayne ends up taking Colonel Taylor's class because his name was not Professor War. His name was Colonel Taylor. He ends up taking Colonel Taylor's class. They become great. He becomes one of his, uh, uh, his assistants. He begins to teach the class, and the rest is history in the show. But I wanted to talk to you today because I believe that believers need to understand that in order for you to go to the next level of your assignment and destiny, you can only go so far on your own. God, God has given you some things in your life that have given you, your gift has made room for you, placed you in front of great people. You see a person skilled in their work, the Bible says they will stand before kings and not mere men, that there are certain things you've been able to do on your own. But in order to fulfill the assignment and the destiny that God has on your life, there are some prerequisites. Some things you cannot avoid. Some things you have to do. Eventually, you have to complete the, free, the prerequisites before you can go to the next level. Um, uh, prayer on Saturdays, I've been teaching us how we walk through the tabernacle and get, in order to get into the presence of God. I think many of us are stuck in our prayer lives and our relationships with God because we have not gone through the prerequisites. 
We're trying to skip into God's presence without taking on some things that God has prescribed. We have some prerequisites. Just as by means of recap, last week we learned that because of what Jesus has done, there are some things that we have, and we are assured that we have. We have, watch this, divine answers. We, we've got divine answers that, that he has given us a spirit of wisdom and understanding. And we can't get answers from the world that we can only get from God. You've got to have the spirit of God on the inside of you. And he reveals to you divine answers. Many of us have, have degraded that, though, to d- demonic opportunities and began to listen to the world. And the devil has given us demonic answers. But we also learned that we've got divine access, that we've got a hope and an inheritance, and we've got access into what it is that God wants to do. And when I say access, it doesn't just mean that we are seated in heavenly places, which we are, but it means we have access to see what it is that God wants for us. We have access to see in the middle of our circumstances what God has promised so you can see yourself where God wants you, even though where you are is not where you want to be. That was good. You can see yourself where God wants you to be, even though where you are is not where you want to be. Because you have hope. Hope is not wishing. Hope is divine expectation that God will do what he said he's going to do. We have an inheritance in Jesus Christ, a glorious inheritance in Jesus Christ, which means we have access to everything in heaven. We, we learn this, and we learn that there, is, uh, there are great promises that God has given us. We also learn, though, that there are enemies to our promises that demonically oppose our divine opportunities. For every divine opportunity, there is a demonic opposite. This week, I want to complete the list of things that we have that will help us dominate the yard. But I want to also warn you that these last two things come with some prerequisites. So let's look back at Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to read the chunk of scripture that we read last week, and then we'll, we'll focus in on the last five verses. Here's what it says. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, don't ever forget the and. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remember, uh, remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength or the same power he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above, watch this, all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet. And appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I'm going to jump in right away and give you the key number three to dominating the yard, and it's divine authority. God has given us. We have divine authority. Verse 19, as we read what Paul is praying for this church and every church that will read this letter, he says he wants you to know the incomparably great power for us who believe. He says he wants us to know the incomparably great power that is in us, that is toward us, that is for us. When Paul writes this, I need you to hear me and understand, Paul is reminding us that Jesus has made good on a proclamation and a promise that he made to his disciples. Jesus says, listen, I do great things and you're impressed by what you see me doing, but greater works will you do. He says, he says, you've seen me heal. I'm going to see you heal. You see me raise the dead. I'm going to see you raise the dead. You, you've seen me proclaim the kingdom and people come out of darkness and into freedom. He says, you're going to proclaim the kingdom. And people are going to come out of darkness and into freedom. The problem is there are many of us who don't know what Jesus promised, so we don't know how to claim it. We, we don't know what it is that Jesus has offered us, and so we don't know how to live it out. 
Paul is saying Jesus has made some proclamations and some promises, and by his blood, he made good on every promise. By his blood, he made good on every promise for you. Why? Because when he died, watch this, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. So that we might be the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Don't miss the text. He who knew no sin took on sin. Nope, became sin. So that when he died, sin died with him. And he says, when I died and sin died with me, I literally took away the legal right of death over your life. Because the wages of sin is death. He says, when I died... Sin died. Now you say, wait, but, but some people still sin. That's a choice. They're resurrecting something dead. They're, they're calling out to the grave and saying, come forth. And because we have power, <laughs> why is it that we believe we can call our sin forth, but don't believe we can call forth the things God wants us to have? Paul reminds us that Jesus has made good on this proclamation, this promise that he made to his disciples. Watch what Jesus promised. Y'all, don't read this like you always read it. Read it with fresh eyes, with divine authority in mind. Matthew 28, verse 17 through 20 says this. When they saw him, they worshiped him. Now, this is, that's the most obvious statement in the world. If you know what Matthew 28 is, it's getting ready to be the Great Commission. Don't jump up to that. But what it is is, is Jesus meeting with his disciples on a mountain after he's been raised from the dead. So when the Bible says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, that's what you do when dead dudes come back to life on their own. When Lazarus came back, nobody worshiped him because Jesus called him out of the grave. When the widow's son, who was, who was dead, when he came back to life, nobody worshipped him because Jesus called him back to life. When Elijah raised the widow's son, nobody worshipped them because somebody else had to raise them up. But Jesus, with power inside of him, got up out of the grave with no help from no one. He is deserving of my worship. So when they saw him, they worshipped him. That is the part that confuses me, but some doubt it. I'm wondering, are they doubting, like, is this really Jesus? I'm hoping it's that. I'm hoping it's not like, I don't know, bro, show me another trick. I hope it's not that. I hope it's not that they see Jesus literally risen from the dead, and they're literally saying, prove it to me. And here's the reason why, because I believe people still do that today. That God has given you indisputable proof of his promises and his power in your life. And you're still like, show me another trick. God has delivered you from sin. God has delivered you from pain. God has delivered you from issues. And you're still looking at God like, do something else. Because, listen, we're never satisfied if we can't believe the greatest miracle that has ever taken place. I'm getting ahead of myself. Here it is. He says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, watch, all authority. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time. The reality is Jesus says all authority has been given to me. We understand, if you don't know this, we believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. Doesn't God already have all authority? He does. But God gave authority to man in the earth. Man relinquishes his authority to the enemy in the Garden of Eden when we sin and disobey God. Every bit of dominion that we have, we give away. Remember, the devil does not have access unless we give him access. And so he has access to the powers of this world. He has access to all of the things that are going on in our lives because we gave him access. He has authority because we gave him authority. And only a man could come back and take back the authority. So God, understanding that David couldn't do it, that Abraham couldn't do it, that Moses couldn't do it, Elijah couldn't do it, Elisha couldn't do it, Job couldn't do it, Isaiah couldn't do it, Daniel couldn't do it. I can go through the whole Old Testament up to the New Testament. John the Baptist couldn't do it. He came in the form of a baby, lived a sinless life, dies the sacrificial death because only a man could take back the authority that man had lost. And God takes back the authority. And what he stands here resurrected is saying, I have all authority. Which is good news for two reasons. One, we get to know that God has all authority. But two, authority on earth has come back into the hands of a man. Oh, y'all missed that. Authority on earth has come back into the hands of a man. You know that there is a physical Jesus in, y'all, y'all, 
I, I believe some crazy stuff because the Bible told me. There is a physical Jesus sitting in heaven at the right hand of God, not rotting, not deteriorating. There is a physical man there because he defeated death. The reason why a physical person couldn't be in heaven before, because sin could not enter into heaven. But now there is a perfect man who gets to sit at the right hand of God. There is a physical man there with all authority. He is now the go-between. He is the ladder that Jacob saw where the angels come in and out on that Jesus predicted. You would see he is there making intercession for us and opening up heaven. Authority is back in the hands of a man, which means that man can have authority. Don't miss, don't miss. Y'all, 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 I'm moving too fast. Here it is. It says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is important. This is important because the father never lost authority. He delegated it to man. Man gave it away. A man came and got it back. He says, all authority has been given to me. Here's what he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This is why you got to share. Now, this ain't just evangelism. This is invitation. But you got to share the good news of Jesus Christ because this is what the authority is for. It's to take back territory for the kingdom of God. And the territory exists in the hearts and the minds of men and women. Y'all know I'm saying man like general, right? Okay. It's 2022. You got to be careful these days. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Watch this. Jesus says, I got all authority, and I'm about to ask you to go do something impossible. What is he saying? He's saying, if I'm telling you to do it, I'm going to authorize you to get it done. If I'm telling you to do it and I have all authority, I'm going to authorize you to get it done. This is the reason why it's important for us to obey what it is that the teachings of Jesus are. Because when we are in line with Jesus, he begins to authorize us for the accomplishments and the assignments. Uh, I, I worked at Cornerstone Baptist Church for several years as the youth pastor, and uh, I, I was a rogue. I was a rogue, and it's the reason why some of y'all in this room are rogues to this day, because God wants to punish me for the rogueness of my own life. Some of y'all don't follow a process that we got. You know why? Because I used to r- buck against my pastor's processes. There was a time when I was getting ready to do this youth event, and I told them, I said, uh, I got the flyers, I got everything done, all this stuff like that, and, and I had to go through the communications director, because it's a process. You have to have a process. I had to go through the communications director director, but I called my boy, and I said, hey, man, make these flyers for me and print up 4,000 of them, and I sent over a check. I got the, I, I was going real rogue. I went to the finance office. I got a check. We cut the check. We sent it. The thing comes back. We in the staff meeting. I'm passing them out because I'm proud of them. They look dope. It was missing critical information. It was supposed to be a paid event for the youth, but there was no cost on this flyer. We have 4,000 of them. We're going to pass out, right? And so now there's no cost on it. So now we're going to have to eat all the cost if we pass these flyers out because the paid cost was going to cover the cost that we were doing. And so uh, what happened was uh, uh, we got it in the room, and they said, uh, why did you have these printed? I was like, because I'm the student pastor. I'm the youth pastor. That's what I do. And we got a fly, uh, uh, flyer. It's better than anything else y'all produce. And I was getting arrogant. Better than anything else that's out here. Like I had to go to another level of quality. I had to go to another level, so I went outside, and I did this, and I was like, but you're missing this, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and I felt small, and my pastor, uh, not one to embarrass me in the office, he said, uh, meet me in my office. <laughs> you know my pastor, you know. <laughs> don't, don't tell him I'm doing it. He said, uh, meet me in my office. I sit down on what we call the brown couch, and he's got a brown couch in his office, and, and when you sit in the brown couch, he's like Professor War. He, he's really good at what he does, but he's intimidating to sit across him. My pastor's a teddy bear. If you meet him in public, he's going to want to hug you and love on you, but when you're in trouble, you don't want to sit across from him. Uh, and so what happens is I'm sitting on the brown couch, and he says, Doc, who authorized this? That's, that's his favorite line. He said, Doc, who authorized this? And I said, I thought I had the authority to do it. He said, you don't have authority. You can't, no, you can't just take authority that's not yours. There's a process, and and if you don't go through the process, you don't have the authority. What he wasn't telling me was that my flyer was bad. What he wasn't telling me that I wasn't doing a good job. What he was telling me was my ability to accomplish was limited by my lack of authorization. And I need to tell you, it's not that you're not gifted. 
It's, it's not that you're not talented. It's not that you don't have skills. It's not that you don't have, have, have education. It's not that you ain't read a few books. But God says your ability to accomplish is limited by your lack of authorization. And Jesus has authorized us for an assignment. He has authorized us to go out and to preach the gospel. Not only does Jesus authorize us to have dominion, but he also restores and releases our power to do it. Acts chapter number 1, verses 7 and 8. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or orders or dates that the Father has set by his own, somebody say authority. But you will receive, somebody say power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's witness this again, that this authority and this power comes for a specific reason. It is to be witnesses of the glory of God. If you just want to put together some prayer service where people are falling out and nobody gets saved, nobody gets transformed, nobody, gets, no, nobody comes closer to Jesus, I don't know if that's God's power. Because for every divine opportunity, there is a demonic opposition. you impressed because somebody can read your credit card numbers. The devil knows that number. It's not a secret. It's not like you have some spiritual black masking over and every time you run your card, he doesn't know your address. You're impressed because you're sitting in services where people can call out addresses. I, I, I'm talking seriously to our churches because we're being duped by witches in the church who are calling themselves people of God. But the assignment of God is for the witness of God to go forth and for people's lives to be changed, for them to know Jesus, and for their lives to be changed, and them to tell other people about Jesus. Yet, yet this individual, get it how I get it, make more money for me, create bigger crowds for myself, get more influence on social media. What, what power are we living under? Because for every divine opportunity, there is a demonic opposite. This power that Jesus promised is the same power that Paul prayed for us to realize we have. Listen, I need you to understand, while you're sitting around waiting for somebody else to show you their power, you're neglecting the power in you. I'm going to say that again. While you're sitting waiting around for someone else to show you their power, you're neglecting the power that lives inside of you. Paul says this power that God has promised you is on the inside of you. He says it's an incomparably great power for us who believe. I don't know about you, but salvation happened to me when I believed in my heart that Jesus was Lord. When I confessed with my mouth, he says at the moment of your belief. You received every bit of power that you need to accomplish all that God has called you to. I need for somebody to understand this. Paul, Paul goes to great lengths. He says it's inc incomparably great power. I mean, power on and of itself is big. It's the word dunamis in the Greek where we get our word dynamite. It's where uh, 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 Nobel, where we get the Nobel Peace Prize, where Nobel uh, went and he asked one of his, his Greek friends, he said, what is the word for explosive power? He said dunamis. He said, well, I'm going to call my invention dynamite. Because he had discovered some way to harness power and then have it explode in a big way. And here's the right word that he used. He used dunamis or dynamite because that is the same word that God uses in the scripture to talk about how he's harnessed power on the inside of you. But it's not meant to be contained on the inside of you. It's meant to be harnessed inside of you until you get into the environment that God has called you to and you release it explosively for transformation and change. Power would have been enough. But he said, incomparably great power. Great, great. The word megathos in the Greek, which means it's mega, it's big, it's huge, it's bigger. It's not, it's not just micro power. It's mega power. Th this power is, is greater than things that you see. As a matter of fact, he says, think about what power you've seen is bigger than that. He said, think, think about, think about you're the most powerful person that you know. And you get it in your head and you say, oh, yeah, I don't want to be punched by Mike Tyson. That's always where I go when I think about power. I don't want to be punched by Mike Tyson. <laughs> and, and here's what he says. It's greater than that. And then you say, well, 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 power is big enough and mega power should be good enough. You say, well, God, how great is the power? He says, this is why I got to add another word. It's incomparably great power. I have no reference point to the power that God has given you. I have nothing that I can compare it to. He says, he says, there's nothing I can lean it up beside. Why, why is this important? Y'all looking at me like, why does he break this down? Oh, that's the word upper balo. It means it's over and above. Yeah. 
It's over and above. Upabalo in the Greek. Why am I bringing it up? Y'all like, oh, you just want to sound like you know something. No, no, no. I need for you to understand something. He says, this power that is explosive, that is greater than the other powers that you can think of, that cannot be compared to any other power that you ever know, is not just a power that's out there. It's the power that's in here. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but what you're facing is nothing for what's inside of you. What you're going through can't stand up to what it is that God has placed in you. And you're moping around thinking about how life is hard when you got power on the inside of you. You're second guessing what it is that you're called to do when this power is on the inside of you. I need somebody to get a revelation about who you really are. There's incomparably great power inside of you you. And Jesus has released that power in you so that you can give him glory in the earth. It's the incomparably great power that he gave to us. It is, watch what Paul says, the same power. It, it is, he says, he says, I can't compare it to anything else. The greatest thing I can show you if you say you believe, because it's the power for those who believe. He said, the greatest thing I can share with you is, if you say you believe, is it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. No, you got to understand, we've watered down the crucifixion. And so these are people who lived watching Roman crucifixion. And then they have 400 plus witnesses who saw Jesus alive. No, no, no. In the first century, there were 400 plus living people who had seen Jesus alive. The resurrection wasn't something that they just celebrated on Easter. It was revolutionary for their lives. I need you to understand this. So when he says, I, I get it, I get it. Let me talk about this power that God has given you. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, y'all be like, okay. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. No, are you serious? Like that level of power is on the inside of me? You got to understand what Paul was telling them. You got to understand what Paul is telling you. And I need you to hear me. If you're not authentically passionate about the resurrection, you will never actively engage in pursuing its power. I got to say it again because y'all missed the statement. I, I spent too much time writing this for y'all to miss it. If you're not authentically passionate about the resurrection, pause, let's think about this. Why do you engage Christianity? Is it because you want God to be your supernatural soothsayer? Is it because you want God to be your psychic friend? Is it because you want God to be your dream coach? Y'all better be careful. I'm walking heavy. Here's why I celebrate and I worship God. Because he's the only one who died and got up again and still lives. He's worthy. If you're not passionate about the resurrection, you'll never actively pursue its power. You won't passionately pursue the power of the resurrection? Because when I say something like, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, you now got to process whether you even really believe the resurrection. This is why he said it's the power to those who believe. This is why y'all see me on the last few weeks, and I apologize for anybody who thinks it's crazy that I'm getting radical in what I believe about what God is going to do in this church. It's because I had to ask myself, what do I believe God is capable of doing? What do I believe God is capable of doing? I keep limiting him to not being able to heal cancer when he raised Jesus from the dead. I keep limiting him to not being able to open up financial doors when he's the one who raised Jesus from the dead. I keep limiting him to not restore broken relationships when he's the one that raised Jesus from the dead. When I begin to understand, French, that I really believe in the resurrection, I start going after everything else. Because I said, if he can do that, he's able to do anything that I ask him to do. And I'm putting a demand on heaven for the will of God to be done in my life, and I believe I got power to do it. Ooh. It's because I believe in the resurrection, though. If you're not passionate about the resurrection, then you'll never pursue or engage the power that's, you, that's in you. Watch this. So what is the prerequisite for divine authority? Submission. Ooh, the S word. The S word. And especially in our, in our community and culture now, you bring up submission, every lady said, where is he going with this? Not this month. Maybe next. 
Oh, I ain't scared. I got power. Here we go. Submission. If you want authority, you got to submit to authority. I love Dr. Ari Vernon. He said, don't tell me who you're over till you tell me who you're under. This, this is why, this is why for the last few weeks, I've been actively engaging and reconnecting with my pastor. Because I find myself out here running rogue. Now, when I get with him, he does actually ask me, hey, what would you do about this? And how would you handle this? And what do you think about this? But I realize I got to get under before I can come over. And I've been actually out here running rogue. No, I ain't been acting crazy and sinning and doing crazy stuff. But I realized there's a lack of authority. And I had to ask myself, where's this lack of authority coming from? I'm not under. And there are many of you who have gifts. And you've seen your gifts take you to places where God is pleased because he wanted to show you what you're capable of. But until you learn to submit, you'll never be able to use that authority. You don't believe me. I got Bible for you. I got a lot of Bible, but, but, but I'm just going to give you a few scriptures. Here's what the Bible says about Jesus and authority. Because if this applies to Jesus, if it applies to Jesus, it's got to apply to you, right? And being found in appearance as a man, this is the Bible uh, from Philippians chapter 2. You go back and read verse chapter, five, chapter, chapter 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not think it robbery or, uh, to be equal with God, but humbled himself. The Bible says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. The Bible says, in being in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. That means that when he came a man, he also knew that what he had to do was humble himself. That's why Jesus got, he was raised by Mary, submitted. He was raised by Joseph, submitted. Oh, well, that's when he was a child. I mean, children need direction. When he was a grown man, he got baptized by John, submitted. (laughs) Well, I'm submitted to the Holy Ghost. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, some say I'm of Apollos, some say I'm of Peter, some say I'm of Paul, and even some say I'm of Jesus. Paul says all this dissension and division is wrong. If you're in the Corinthian church, you need to be under the leadership of the Corinthian church. And stop saying you just under Jesus because Jesus ain't even uh, repping your rebellion. Uh, I got a word that told me to just give it to y'all like I got it, and I'm going to do that. Here it is. Uh, here it says, says, therefore, watch this. Watch, watch what happens, though. I told you, you get a divine authority from submission. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Somebody say humbled himself. Humble. By becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross, which means he's like, wait, God, you going to let me die as a criminal? You know what people going to think about me? Like, I'm anointed, and you want me holding somebody's bag? I'm not saying that's what you got to do. I'm just saying, y'all won't even, we won't even hold a door. We won't even serve and hold a door. Jesus died a criminal's death. I'm just too anointed to do all of that. Well, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him. I told you I got a lot of scripture. The scripture that comes to my head in this moment is humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, he'll exalt you. This is what Jesus did. The Bible says, therefore, he exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Watch this. He went from dying a criminal's death to the Bible saying, at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Notice this. This is supernatural power. Y'all been waiting on this thing to happen when everybody just says, oh, my God, I was wrong. I was a Buddhist, and now Jesus comes. Jesus says, that's true. One day, whether you vol- you're going to bow voluntarily or involuntarily. I prefer that you bow voluntarily because when the involuntary bowing comes, it's too late. But here's the thing. It's not just for those people who don't believe what we believe. This is why we share the gospel. But he says, every knee shall bow. He said, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, it's a different world. He says, you've been only seeing the flesh. He said, angels and demons are subject to the name. Y'all missed it. Angels and demons are subject to the name. That's going to be important in just a minute. Here's what the Bible says. Watch this. In Luke chapter 10. Oh, why, 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 why is every knee going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Again, he exalted him 
to give him this name. And the name was for the glory of God the Father. Why do we get power? For the glory of God. Why, why do we get exalted? For the glory of God. If what you, wrote, what you wrote down may not be wrong, the Bible says we see in part. If it doesn't have a comma and at the end say, for the glory of God, it's incomplete. Y'all missed it. God gave you the vision and you wrote it down. We, we, I'm going to travel the world, period. Mm -mm. Comma, for the glory of God. I, I'm going to make a million dollars, period. Mm -mm. Comma, for the glory of God. I'm, I'm going to get married, period. Comma, for the glory of God. I'm going to remain single, period. Mm -mm. Comma, for the glory of God. I'm going to struggle. Not, not, not struggle in life like in poverty and all that. I'm talking about when the enemy comes against me, I won't lay down. I'll fight. Yeah, I'll endure the struggle, comma, for the glory of God. If it means I got to suffer, period, nope, comma, for the glory of God. Because he said in due season, I'm going to reap. That's why I suffer. Because in due season, I'm going to reap, comma, for the glory of God. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Watch this. I uh, lost my place. There it is. Uh, and not only did this happen with, with Jesus, but Jesus delegated this authority to his followers. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20, the Bible says, The 72 returned, and with joy, with, returned with joy and said, Even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I, give you I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Whenever you read about snakes and scorpions in Scripture, it's in reference to demonic activity. But that was what he said. They came back excited, saying, even the demons are cast out or tremble in your name. Even the demons, uh, 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 even the demons submit to us, rather, in your name. He said, I saw, saw Satan fall, uh, fall like lightning from heaven. He said, I, I, I took care of their boss. I, I saw him fall out of heaven. The reality is because you submitted to me. Now they have to submit to you. I've got authority over who got authority over them. Here the problem is that we're afraid of what the devil might do to us and not respecting what God has given us. Here's what he says. Watch the text. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Some of the power of the enemy. I mean most of the power of the enemy. I mean the stuff that is like from... 2020 on. Like, God says all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, here it is again. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this evangelism thing heavy for us because we missed this in Scripture. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. That's great power. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Why am I saying this? Because I keep talking about all this power, and some of y'all really want to be spooky. Now, next thing y'all want to do, y'all just want people to fall out every weekend, every weekend, every weekend, every weekend. And I'm praying that God will start doing stuff, where miracles start happening. But I refuse to have a freak show. And not a place where the glory of God shows up, where people are saved, delivered, and healed. Where, where people are saved, delivered, and healed. I'll show it to you in the scripture in just a little bit. I promise you, this is, this is, this is all Bible. Y'all been reading these scriptures, you just, you just been reading them too fast. The spiritual world, watch this, operates based on rank and order. I'm going to move quickly through this. The way the enemy wins, though, is when he convinces us to break said rank and order. The spiritual world operates on rank and order. Like, like when the Bible talks about rule, power, authority, principalities, all these things, they, they operate in order. Like, demons are more obedient than you think. While they are rebellious to God, they are obedient to their master. Satan is their ruler. He gives them instructions. They do it. Now, watch this. Because God overrun Satan, there are times you can watch even in the scripture where God commands demons. Old Testament and new. When Jesus showed up, the reason why demons start trembling in the synagogues, I question our churches, when Jesus would show up, demons would start getting scared. Ah, why are you here to torture me? What are you talking about? Why are you messing with me? Well, well, here's what Jesus did. Jesus shows up with authority, and they knew there's going to come a day where Jesus is going to deal with them. And they were afraid because he has authority over them. When demons see you, they should have the same response they had to Jesus. The problem is we got familiar spirits. 
What do you mean, pastor, by familiar spirits? The demon is not afraid of me because me and he do the same thing. He's a lust demon, and I got a, my heart full of lust. <sighs> He's a greed demon, and my heart is full of greed. He's a pride demon, and my heart is full of pride. He, <sighs> He's a demon that, that plants bitterness in the hearts and minds of people, and all I do is run around sowing discord and bitterness in other people. The reason why I can't cast it out is because we friends. We familiar. Watch this. We family. And the Bible says a house divided against itself can't stand. So whenever you're in cohesion or coercion with a certain type of spirit, y'all family. And you need to come back to the family of God and say, I want to look more like my elder brother Jesus than I do this demon that's been influencing my life. Help me, Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm going to run out of time again. <laughs> y'all see why I couldn't finish this message last week? Watch this. Uh, uh, here it is. God has chosen to distribute his authority and, and power through the church. Somebody say through the church. There are many people who want to do parachurch ministry. That's fine. Many people who want to do ministry outside the church. They want to have their own podcast and all that stuff. That's fine. But God has chosen to distribute his power through the church. Somebody say through the church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19, Jesus replied, when Simon Peter made the confession that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, he asked him, who do you say that I am? Peter makes a confession, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Again, salvation statement. Y'all don't, y'all missing what I'm telling you? That the power and authority comes, he gave salvation. Now watch what Jesus does at the salvation moment. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Authority comes where salvation exists, right, or where deliverance is, or where the revelation of salvation is. I will give you, watch what he says next, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever, somebody say whatever, you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Context. I'm going to build my church. So what is the key to authority? Submission. Where? In the church. The reason why many of us don't want to submit is because our abuses, and I'm going to admit, there have been abuses in the church. But here's the problem. It's no longer the abuses when you found a place that won't abuse you. It's your attitude. I'm going to say it again. The reason why we don't submit is because of abuses. But it's no longer the abuses when you found a place that won't abuse you. It's now your attitude. And the Lord says, I'm trying to get power into you, but you refuse to submit. Watch what the text says in Matthew 18, 18 through 20. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Binding and loosing. Can I give it to you real quick? The context of this scripture is not for you and your homegirl to go sit on a prayer line and say you're going to bind everything if you're not submitted somewhere. This particular text, Matthew 18, is about church discipline. Y'all taking this stuff out of context. He literally says, if somebody's in sin, go to them in private. If, they, if, they, if you win them, they could. He says, if you don't, take another witness. He says, if you don't win them still, take them to the And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. Demons are being bound because we're not submitted to God's order. Because we live in a day and age where everybody wants to put a camera in there, get a nice little light ring and a cell phone, and bash the church. Oh, oh let's talk about it because I'm sick of seeing it. And we're thinking that's going to help people? No, you're destroying God's order. We got family order destroyed. We got church order destroyed. We got media order destroyed. We got arts and entertainment destroyed. We got government destroyed. We got business. Y'all notice all of the mountains being destroyed. And now the church is eating herself alive, calling out as cannibal, cannibals to each other, destroying each other over abuses when there are healthy churches trying to grow and show people the power of God. I get it. It's a real topic. It needs to be talked about. But let's be careful how we talk about God's wife. <laughs> Allowing the enemy to negate the position of the church in your life will eventually neutralize the power of God in your life. 
I should have put that one on the screen. I'm going to say it again. Y'all need to write this down. Allowing the enemy to negate the position of the church in your life will eventually neutralize the power of God in your life. If you want power, it comes through submission. And the place in which God has given us as a playground or a, not a playground, a practice place for submission is in groups, in the church. I'm not telling you, this is not a message about bow down to Robert White. This is not it. I, I told them this morning, I was very intentional. I was up here and I was moving around and they were telling me where to stand and where not to stand. And I said, in this moment, somebody was in the room, what I say? I'm submitted to you. Because the Lord been dealing with me on this. That there is order in the kingdom. That you gotta, we got to learn how to submit. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 21 about everybody. Then he breaks it down to husbands and wives. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, who is the one another? The church. There's no submission if we're not submitting to one another. All right, last point, and i got to do this in about seven minutes. Y'all ready? The last thing that we get is divine assistance. This is my favorite point, and i got to give it to you in seven minutes. Here it is. We get divine assistance. When you go back to Paul, he says that this incomparably great power for us who believe, the power that is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead, watch this, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Don't miss this. The right hand uh, in, in Roman days was the hand of strength. That most people are right-handed. I don't like it. It's discrimination. Y'all, God, God talking about this right-handed stuff. That it's, it's God, though, so I got to obey. I'm left-handed. God, I got a lefty, and it's strong. But what you want to do is what you want to do. I'm submitted. <laughs> Here it is. Most people are right-handed. So a Roman soldier would carry his shield over his left hand and his sword in his right hand. So that if the enemy was going to be defeated, it would happen by the sword and the right hand. Y'all got to follow me. This is good and this is deep. That he would cause the shield in the left hand and the sword in the right hand. Later, Paul would describe the armor of God. And he would say there is a shield of faith. And there is a sword which represents the word of God. Jesus goes and he sits at the right hand of God. That's an anthropomorphism. What does that mean? It means that we are giving God human attributes so that he could be God for dummies. God doesn't have a literal right hand. He is eternal. God doesn't have a literal right hand. He is omnipresent. God doesn't have a literal right hand. He's spirit. But, but the Bible says Jesus is seated at his right hand. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. The Bible says that Jesus is the word made flesh. The Roman soldier would take the, the sword and he would destroy the enemy with it. What God is saying is, you got faith in God, but at the right hand of God is divine assistance from Jesus, which is the word of God in your life. <laughs> I never fenced in my life. <laughs> But that's what it would feel like if I did. He says, I'm going to chop up the enemy by your faith and what you believe about the word. And notice the scripture in Romans that faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That the two go together. You can't have one without the other. And I need somebody to understand that God wants to give you some divine assistance through Jesus who sits at the right hand of God. But we're not done. We're not done. There's still more to see. Watch this. Uh, the text says, the text says that he's seated at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above, now this is not just about where he sits positionally. It's where he sits with the power. So that means his power overrules, watch this. I can't, don't have time for this. We have to come back and do another series on it. All rule and authority, power and dominion. Each one of these represents something that is a spiritual force of darkness in the atmosphere. There's a different kind, a rule and an authority, a dominion and a power. They all represent something different. I'm not going to explain them today, but they each represent something different. You need to learn how to identify what's attacking you so that you can use the right weapon to fight. At the end of the day, you've got power to wield the weapon. Why is it, thank you, Holy Spirit, this is not in my notes. Why is it that David had trouble wearing Saul's armor, but he could wield Goliath's sword? 
watch this, he had never used Goliath's sword before. He couldn't wear Saul's armor because it was too big and clunky for him. It was uncomfortable. But he could pick up Goliath's giant sword and use it. Because when I'm in the assignment and the purpose of God, I get power to use things that I could not do naturally. Goliath's sword had to be bigger than Saul's. Goliath's sword had to be heavier than Saul's. Goliath's sword had to be more, uh, more, more weaponry than what Saul's was. But because he was in his divine assignment, he had power to wield the sword. And the Lord told me to tell somebody that when you get in line and submit yourself to the plan and purposes of God, you're going to be able to wield the sword that your natural mind and your natural heart cannot do alone. Help me, Holy Ghost. You can't give me stuff out my notes in. I can't. Some going to have to go. All right, here we go. Uh, we in the middle of NBA assist week. I love it because NBA had handles week. They had dunk week. Now we in assist week. If you know what an assist is, an assist is when somebody on the floor has the ball. And they pass the ball to somebody else who then makes the basket. That person gets credit for the points. But the person who passed the ball gets credit for the assist. Here's what I believe God wants to do in the life of a believer. God's got sweet handles. And he drops dimes. That means he throws assists. That God wants to allow you to score in the earth. There are going to be some things that your coworkers see you do. And they'll be like, I can't believe that you were able to do that. You got to look back and say, assist to the spirit. You got to begin to look back and say, assist to the father. Assist to the son. Assist to the word. God wants to throw dimes to you. But here's the thing, Natasha. A good, a good person who throws passes won't throw it to a person at a position. That, that when I know you're in position, I can get the ball to you. When I see you in position, I can get you. You got to be in scoring position in order to receive the assist. Basketball players, back me up. You got to be in scoring position in order for me to get the assist to you. The problem with many of us is we're trying to do our own thing and then call for the ball. Ball! Ball! And the spirit is like, you ain't in scoring position. So he's at the top of the key with the ball waiting on somebody to get in position. As a matter of fact, he, 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 he's gotten double teamed, so he passes the rock to the angels, and the angels work off rank and order. And so the rank and order, they're dribbling the ball, and they're looking, and here you are out of position, double teamed in the corner by your lust, double teamed in the corner by your greed, double teamed in the corner by your pride, double teamed in the corner by disobedience, and you're calling for the ball. Ball! Ball! And the angels, I, I, can I tell you, can I tell you another thing, though? Watch this. Maybe you're open. But the angels know you just want to pad your stats. And they say, this ain't got nothing to do with the team. If I pass you the ball, the only thing you're going to do is show off. Matter of fact, the angels may not get the assist because you won't take the shot. You're going to start dribbling. You're going to start showing off. You're going to start doing things and get yourself out of scoring position and maybe miss the opportunity. Can I talk to somebody that I need for somebody in Freedom Church to begin to believe God's word and begin to stand in position and receive the divine assist. I got a couple of scriptures I want to share with you, but I need you to understand that the rock is available. Oh, y'all missed it. The Bible says that he's the chief cornerstone. He's the rock in which the builders rejected. The rock is available, but you got to be in position. Help me, Holy Spirit, in this place. Sit down if you can. I got a couple of scriptures to give you. I know I'm long, but y'all going to have to get this book today. Don't forget this. Your calling is going to take you beyond your comfort. Luke 9, 1 and 2 says, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Amen. Now watch what he told them to do. He gave them power and authority to drive out, somebody say, all demons. All and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 6 says, so they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Verse 1 and 2 says, drive out demons, cure disease, proclaim the kingdom, heal the sick. Verse 6 says, they proclaimed the good news and healed the people. 
I've been telling you how this power is connected to the gospel of the kingdom. That what we get power for is to preach the kingdom. Here's the other extent of opposite. We want power just for power's sake. But there are others of us who just want to share the gospel and show no power. And we've got churches where people can academically articulate the gospel, but no demons are coming out. We got people who have an intellectual ascent into what the verbs and the Hebrew Greek nouns and things are, but there's demons in the church. And Jesus says, yes, heal the sick. Yes, proclaim the gospel. But I need for you to cure diseases. Notice there's a difference between healing the sick and curing disease. A healed person could catch it again. A cured person will never get it again. Because if the disease is so, he didn't say cure the person. He said cure the disease. If there's a cure for the disease, that means there's an end for it. Why is it that the body of Christ is not reaching for cures? We just settle for healing. I know everybody can't handle this type of teaching. I get it. Why is it that the body of Christ is settling for things that God, here's what it is. Watch. We're settling for eternity with hell on earth. We got folk going to be demonically influenced all the way to the pearly gates. I, I, I don't want to argue with you about whether a believer can be possessed or not. You sure can't be lied to by one, though. And you sure can believe the lie. And we got people who are going to be demonically influenced all the way to the gate. And your soul is going to be saved, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says. But it's going to be a lot of stuff get burned off. So much more that Jesus wanted to do with you. But because you didn't see what the fullness of the power and authority of God was for your life. Cast out, that was number one. Cast out demons. Cure disease. Proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And heal the sick. I believe the order has significance. I believe that if we begin to cast out demons, if we begin to lead in such a way that, watch this, you know what I'm talking about. You on your job and you a light, but there's a demonic influence over you. I believe, I believe that you don't have to preach the gospel first. You need to take authority over that place. If you begin to take authority over that place and you begin to cure whatever disease that infestation has made in that place, you'll be able to preach the gospel. And then the folk who got sick from the infestation of the place, you can begin to heal the sick. Y'all missed the order. The, The problem with us is we've settled. Watch this. The disciples do what Jesus tells them to do. And it was their submission that produced the power they were promised. But remember... Whenever you're committed to doing the will of God, the enemy is committed to discouraging you. You you know, you get the marriage you prayed for, but now the two of y'all just can't seem to get on the same page. You know, you got the promotion, but now it feels like your boss is a boss straight out of hell. You start coming to church, but now it feels like you can't get connected. It's all discouragement and distraction from the enemy. You've got the authority to overcome it. And when when it gets difficult, you just need to stay in position because the assist is coming. Look at nine, Luke 9. I got to give you Bible because all that assist talk is good, but you need to see it in Scripture. Luke 9, 37 through 40. Remember, they preached the gospel and they healed the sick, but then they ran into a demon. The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, teacher, I beg you to look at my son for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely leaves him and, his, and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it, drive it out, but they couldn't. It's not that they couldn't. He gave him authority to do it. (laughs) Don't tell me what I can't do and God told me what I could do. Notice it was not Jesus who said they couldn't. It was the man who said they couldn't. Because the man wasn't in the room when Jesus said you can. And there are going to be people who tell you what you can't do because they never heard what God told you to do. And don't you let people tell you what you can't do when they did not tell you, they did not hear what God told you you would do. Stop letting people talk you out of what God shared with you because they don't know what's possible in God. Yeah. I got, I got to move, I got to move, I got to move. Watch this. So what happens is, uh, uh, he says, they could not draw it out. Uh, uh, and Jesus looks at them, and he, he makes some choice comments. He says, oh, wicked and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? And he goes into that. But, but he eventually casts the demon out. Mark chapter 9 tells the account of the same story. And it says, afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with the disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out. Only by prayer. Now, the the New King James says prayer and fasting, which means there are some things you need the assist for. 
What happens when we pray? Prayer is calling for the assist when you're in position. They're in front of the demon. They're called to cast out demons. They're in position. They're being obedient to the word of God. They're in position. They could have called out to the Lord. They could have called out for divine assistance. Watch what assistance you have. It's not just Jesus and not just even the power within you. You've got angelic assistance. Amen. Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 through 5 says, Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people. The incense was to be offered with the prayers of all God's people, which means my prayers don't hit the roof and come down. There's an angel who grabs my prayers and takes them up, and in the incense of the worship with God, he mixes it in and presents it. Why is this important? Because we see in the tabernacle, when they burn incense, it is the aroma that goes up to God that pleases him and causes him to act on the people's behalf. And watch what happens then. When the prayers of the saints go in with the incense, God is pleased that he begins to act on the people's behalf, which means your prayers are mixed with angelic worship in order for you to get divine results. <laughs> your prayers are mixed with angelic worship so that you can get divine results. I got to move on. Uh, here's what it says. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. Your prayers will make it in front of God. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. That means there's a divine assistance. The prayers are getting there. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There ain't no drama in heaven. What he's hurling is not drama. What he's hurling is not wickedness. What he's hurling is not sin. What he's hurling is divine assist. Oh, y'all missed it. He's hurling it. Y'all missed it. He, 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 he's hurling it. He's, hur, he, hur, he, hurling it. Hur, oh, y'all missed it. He's giving divine assistance. And when your prayers go up, the Bible says that divine assistance is coming. There is angelic assistance available to you. Let me read one more scripture for you. Hebrews chapter 114 says, Are not all angels ministering, assisting spirits to serve those who will inherit salvation? The purpose of angels is to do the will of God. The will of God is for you to, be, be, uh, to have dominion over the earth. Y'all missed it. The purpose of the angels is to do the will of God. The will of God is for us to have dominion over the earth. Amen. You've got divine assistance. Amen. The prerequisite to assistance is service. Write that down. I know it feels good to receive the assistance, but you got to serve. Yeah. Why do I say you got to serve? Because the angels are watching to see if you're doing the will of God. Are you serving God? Are you serving? Are you in position? I, 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 I'm, I'm going to be real practical. We got somebody called a liberator coordinator in our church. And their divine assignment is to connect you to your position so that you can serve well in the church where you should be submitted. Y'all miss what I just said. We've strategically put things in place for you to receive power in position. We've, we've strategically set it up for you to get authority and assistance. But because we're not submitted, we don't even know that this happened. And then we want prayer for what it is we got authority over. But because we ain't submit to authority, we won't have no authority. And because we're not in position, we can't receive the assist. I'm going to close with this. Now, I need you to get this. I, I got to say this. The Bible never encourages you to go run around seeking after angels. There's no scripture that tells you to go around seeking angels. Like, I'm going to go find my guardian angel. Stop it. And stop saying that when somebody dies, grandma got her wing. You know that to become an angel will be a demotion for you? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we will judge angels. You talking about they got their wings. No, 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 no. Y'all out here spouting bad theology to comfort yourselves and wonder why you get no comfort. The Bible says it's the spirit who brings comfort. And if you're going to speak outside of the will of God, you're not going to get no comfort. You don't know why you're still grieving? Because you're spouting lies. And I know some of those lies out of ignorance. And I'm trying to teach you today. Don't ever say it again. Yeah. Grandma got her wings. She ain't getting no wings. That ain't what the Bible teach. Amen. That's not what the Bible teaches. Some of y'all mad because y'all, all of y'all's grandmas got wings in y'all mind. Y <laughs> hey, y'all's a trip. Y'all looked at me with the heart. So, so what then? God, God, God needed another angel. What foolishness are we speaking? 
got him on Facebook with the little blue background and the, and the clouds and the wings. In loving memory of. I got a new angel. You have one, but it ain't grandma. Grandma worshiping. Grandma's in the cloud of witness. Grandma getting her reward. Grandma ain't doing what you think she doing. Grandma's in possession. <laughs> Not my grandma. She's still alive. Praise God, that lady. <laughs> it's your grandma. <laughs> my other grandma. I got another grandma in heaven. Praise God. <laughs> Stand on your feet. <laughs> All of that. Y'all y'all silly, man. I got I to get into the church. Um, the divine assistance that we receive, I, I was thinking about it. And I was thinking about how the Bible teaches us that Jesus is our mediator. And that there is no one mediator between God and man. That is the man Christ Jesus. That we, we, we are ascending up and down into heavenly realms because of our access through Jesus. And I was thinking about this, and Amazon gave me a great picture of the kingdom. Because when I call on the name of Jesus, I get access to everything Amazon has to offer. And Alexa is kind of like Jesus. Alexa is my mediator between me and Amazon. When I call her name, I, I can get answers. I can get facts. I can say, Alexa, what's the weather like? She gives me answers. When I call Alexa, I can get access. She, she downloads apps. I even got my Bible app on Alexa every morning at 5 a.m., whether I wanted to or not. She says, would you like for me to continue to read the book of Revelation? Don't she do it? I ain't lying. <laughs> and I'll be like, no, nah, Alexa, I'm going to read it on my own. But I got access through apps. I actually have even authority. I can turn on and off lights and alarms through Alexa. I've got authority when I call Alexa's name. But what I've learned to love is when I get that assistance from Alexa. Because she shows me what's available at the warehouse in comparison to my needs. Every now and again, Alexa will have this little yellow light. And I'll say, read notifications. And Alexa will say, uh, based on your shopping habits, <laughs> there are some things that are available and blah, 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 blah. Would you like for me to order them for you? Uh, Alexa saying, I, I can provide assistance for stuff you didn't even know you needed. Uh, Alexa saying, there are things available to you that you ain't even know you needed. All you got to do is say my name. When the little yellow light comes on, that's telling me I have it. But I don't get access to it until I say her name. When I say Alexa, she lights up and she begins to give me the assistance I need. I need for you to not leave this place today without calling on the name of Jesus for whatever it is that Jesus has available to you. He's got divine assistance available to you, and the only thing you have to do is call on his name. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, divine assistance is here to save you. All you got to do, somebody say, say his name. He says, he says, just say my name. For those of you who need a, a divine assistance in your marriage, all you got to do is say his name. For those of you who need divine assistance on your job at school, all you got to do is say his name. The Bible says at the name of Jesus, every knee, every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That means everything going on in heaven that's supposed to assist you when you call on Jesus gets activated. Everything that's going on on earth that's trying to oppose you gets eliminated. And everything that's happening under the earth in demonic activity that's trying to terminate you, God says, I obliterate it. In the name of Jesus today, I need you to leave this place hungry for what it is that God has for you. I thank you for tolerating and putting up with this long message, but I believe it's important for what it is that God is trying to do in your life. I believe God is transforming and changing your life. There's so much more we could teach on this, and we will in the future. But, but I want to just give you these intros because you have divine authority. But your prerequisite is to submit. You have divine assistance, but your prerequisite is service. Don't walk away from what it is that you have simply because your pride won't let you do what you're called to do. Give your life to Jesus today. Recommit your life to Jesus. Stand tall in the name of Jesus. Listen. Let's pray. If you, if you uh, need prayer for any reason, especially to give your life to Jesus, the prayer team will be here. And when, not, when you open your eyes from the time I'm done praying, they'll be standing here, and they'll be willing to lead you 
uh, to Jesus, and they'll be willing to give you uh, a prayer for whatever you need in this room today. God, thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity that we have. God, I pray for those who will come for prayer, for salvation, for whatever reason they'll come for, God. I pray that you would deliver them right now. God, I pray for those that may not come to the front but might go to the tables in the back to receive prayer or write their prayer requests down there. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would move through them in a mighty way as well. God, we pray that every bit of power that we've been experiencing here at Freedom would not just be so that we can have a show, but so that salvations can